In situations where we're doing a hypothesis test for the mean, it's usually clear because the question's in terms of the mean. When you're doing a hypothesis test for the proportion, what you want to look for is a claim that's about a percentage. And the information you're given could be either a count, as we have here. Here we have 120 out of 200. Or you could be given a sample percentage. It really depends on the type of problem you're looking at. So no different than before, I'm still going to go through uh, and figure out what information I have. So a researcher believes that more than 65% of people can name three characters from The Simpsons. So the first thing I see is that we have a claim that the population percentage is more than 65%. Okay, notice I didn't write mu, right? I wrote p because we're talking about a population proportion or percentage. So we have a random sample of 200, so n is 200. And in that sample, 120 could name three characters from The Simpsons. Now that's, a, that's actually the number of successes. Whatever we're counting is a success, and that's represented by x, just like when we were doing a binomial distribution. So this is 120. Now, if we were instead given a sample proportion, like in this case, it's actually 60%, then what I would do is I'd have to figure out X because our calculator wants to know X and I'd have to multiply it times uh, the N. And then I'd be able to have X and I'd plug it into the calculator. Okay, but we have the information, so I'm going to keep going. And so we're not given much else. All it says now is, does the evidence support the researcher's claim at alpha equals 0.1? All right, so as long as our sample sizes are big enough, and usually what you're looking for is that you have at least five successes, um, which I do, then you're able to say, okay, the sampling distribution for p hat is going to be normal, and that means I can use some type of z-test here. And the test that we're going to use is called a one-prop z-test, a one-prop z-test. And so my h not and ha, the claim didn't have an equality, so it's ha, p is bigger than 0.65. And in this case, H0 would then be P is less than or equal to 0.65. So as usual, what I need is a p-value. Now, it's easy to get confused because on the calculator, you have so many different things that come out. The p-value on the calculator is just labeled uh, P, but you're not going to compare it to 65%. You're always going to compare the p-value to alpha. So it's under stat and test just like before. And what I'm looking for is a one prop Z test. And so once I get in there, the first thing it asks me for is P naught, which is from your hypothesis test, that's 0.65. And then the number of successes, X, 120, out of the sample, which is 200. Then it wants to know what tail test. This is a right tail test. And I go down to calculate and end up with a very large P value of 0 0.9309. This is certainly bigger than alpha, right? Bigger than any alpha we could have. So just as before, automatically I know I fail to reject H0. That does not change here. So if I fail to reject H0, that means there's no evidence for HA. So when the question asks, does the evidence support the researcher's claim at 0.10, I say no. There is no evidence that more than 65% of people can name it three characters from The Simpsons. So you're probably starting to notice a pattern with hypothesis testing. With the p-value method, everything stays the same, but where I get the p-value from changes. When we do the rejection region method, everything will stay the same, but where I get the rejection region will change. That's because depending on what we're testing here and what type of tests we're doing, the distribution for the sampling statistic that we're looking at might be different. And so that's how we determine our p-value or our rejection region. But in the end, the general operation, the general procedure is always the same.